Biology 11. We're going to forge on with Chapter 20, Section 3, specifically plant-like protists. Now this topic is going to focus on the unicellular algae, meaning we're going to look at protists that act like plants but tend to be unicellular. True enough, they can get lonely and they can come together and form colonies. Um, what you what you should be aware of is that we're talking about inherently unicellular groups here, okay? So if you click on plant like protists in the course website, you'll be taken to this little trophy here, which is all about our unicellular algae by and large. And we're going to study three major groups, the Euglenophyta, okay, that's a phylum, Pyrophyta, and Pyro is a very apt description because they're quite red. And the crystal group, crystal phylum, I like to refer to them as, uh, the chrysophytes, specifically diatoms and desmids. And you have a beautiful picture of diatoms up here. Beautiful little shells, and they can move around. You just don't see their flagella very easily there. And we've got some uh, goodies for you here. The course site is showing um, thumbnails, if you will, of some of these flash animations. But if you just click on flash video there, you'll go to the larger version. Okay, so we'll, we'll get going with this. I'll pop um, in and out from the lesson to these resources because I really want you to get a feel for what's there. And as per usual, you should investigate those resources more heavily to get a better feeling for it. That's why it's there. Okay, so the unicellular algae. Now by algae, let's highlight this. Our friends, the algae are plant-like things floating on the surface of water or in the, there in the water column. If you've ever been out to Klukas Lake, you've certainly seen the algae sort of clouding the lake, floating there. And what it does is what any plant would do. Photosynthesize, make sugars using the energy of sunlight. That's kind of its modus operandi. That's what it does. This slide is a little erroneous. I have to update it. It says that there are four phyla of unicellular algae. Not really... 100% accurate there. Now let's let's clarify this. First thing I would say is that that should read three phyla and I'll explain. The reason why there are three phyla is that these diatoms you see right here are a wonderful example of our chrysophytes. So I'm gonna make a change. Example diatoms. There we go. Now these phyla can also be referred to as divisions. The botanists like to call plant-like things not by their... They, they don't use the term phylum. They like to use the term divisions. It, it means the same thing. They're just synonyms. Phyla or divisions. There we go. So these are the three we'll be talking about throughout the presentation. Uh, I'll save my description for them. But when we did lab work, what I will say is that we, we got a really nice view of pretty well each one of these on prepared slides or live, whichever way. Since we're talking about plant-like organisms, remember, these diatoms don't have cell walls and they're not multicellular. They really don't fit into the plant kingdom, right? You have to be multicellular and photosynthetic to be in the plant kingdom. These aren't. So they do have characteristics in common with plants. Specifically, they have chlorophyll, which is a greenish or yellowy greenish chemical, depending which variety you look at. But they also have what are called accessory pigments. Accessory pigments are the other colors that you see, uh, especially in the fall. Now we're in Prince George and when the leaves in the fall begin to change color, um, what the plant is doing is it's drinking in the chlorophyll, the green chemical, because that's very nutritious. <laughs> nutritious, And all that is left behind in the leaf is kind of like the leftover chemicals and many of them are accessory pigments that are in the leaf and the plant doesn't by and large take them all in. It just sheds them and they're gone and it grows them again in the new leaves for the next year. So it's neat because in the fall we see beautiful yellows and reds and oranges. It makes fall my favorite time of the year. But you have to stop and ask what exactly does an accessory pigment do? 
it's a photosynthesis helper. So photosynthesis, I'll just say PS. It helps chlorophyll do its job. Um, you can almost think of it as, as being a football team. It's on the team and it's making sure that chlorophyll, the quarterback, can get the job done. Photosynthesis is all about harvesting uh, photons of light and when the light strikes the green chemical or the photosynthetic pigment, whichever it is, that actually generates electrons to help make chemical bonds to produce sugar. Now, if you think that's interesting, um, at the university level, there's a course known as biochemistry, uh, biochemistry 200, some universities it's 300, and they go into full detail on how that all works. And it's, I, I recommend it. It's a wonderful journey to learn how photosynthesis happens. It's quite a process to take carbon dioxide out of the air and some water out of the ground and essentially bang them together, forge chemical bonds to produce carbohydrates. So photosynthesis needs a lot of help. It takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of photons and it takes a lot of chlorophyll and accessory pigments to make photosynthesis successful. There are a lot of accessory pigments. If you remember back uh, to our previous discussion, one of our previous lessons, it's the accessory pigments that defined the, the algaes, the seaweeds we were looking at before. In fact, we looked at a couple of different ones. We looked at, let's go here, we looked at brown algae. And brown algae, known as phylum phaophyta, these guys here, there we go. This one has uh, an accessory pigment in it, which gives it sort of this brown color. There's chlorophyll in there, but it more or less is, it would otherwise be a green plant, but um, it, that's fucoxanthin that makes that kind of a brown color. So we kind of saw that before, fucoxanthin. And if we look at our red algaes, our red algae, which go, uh, lives down deep in the water, there we go, has phycobilins. And it has phycobilins and that enables it to harvest, in particular, blue light. It's very good at getting at light, even when down in the deep. And that those phycobilins give it that wonderful sort of red color, like that. Our last ones, our green algae, gave rise, or what we believe gave rise to our land plants. And when you look at our green algaes, typical ulva and silas and things like that that we would see, um, there's some unicellular ones here, but our green algaes, by and large, sort of, you find them in, in pond water tanks. Um, our green algae are probably, well, not probably, we're quite sure these gave rise to our mosses, and gave rise to our liverworts and eventually something like ferns. So just pop back here. Now there's a whole host of accessory pigments that define uh, our different types of algae. Specifically, uh, here's a neat little diagram I managed to pull into my annotation software here. What this shows is that there's a real competition going on for light. Now if we zoom in on chlorophyll A, uh, we should point out that the visible spectrum of light that you're seeing here, let's see if I can pop this away, there we go. When you look at light, it runs anywhere from about 250 to 700 nanometer wavelengths. That's the, that's the spectrum of light. That's how big the waves are, if you will, when you're looking at visible light. Now, inside of that, we have Roy G. Biff, red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, and violet. And along the bottom here, Let's see if I can pull this over. Just get an annotation tool. I think I'll stick to hmm, I'll stick to brown. When you look at our wavelength, our violets are here, and our warmer colors, as we go through our colds, blue and green, we get over towards our reds. So what we have is a competition for different wavelengths of light. So without getting into this. Um, too well in too uh, 
defined a way. Chlorophyll A is really good. Chlorophyll A is good at, and I'll just draw straight down, going after sort of the violet and blue wavelengths of light. And some of our accessory pigments over here, phycocyanins, the reason why they're so useful, now phycocyanins, that's something you would see, for example, in blueberries, right? Makes blueberries quite blue. When you look at our phycocyanins and you wonder, well, what is that accessory pigment helping? Well, it's helping the plant absorb sort of the yellow to red wavelengths of light. I'll just zoom in here. Uh, phycoerythrin. Uh, a very reddish pigment, not quite as purple as this one here. Each of these lines shows the color, more or less, uh, of that specific uh, photosynthetic pigment. But phycoerythrin, if I draw straight down, do my best here, goes after this wavelength of light, which is somewhere between green and yellow. So you can see what they do is they broaden the amount of light that you can absorb, and that turns out to help photosynthesis in general, because it is a struggle for existence after all. All right. So accessory pigments, big deal. So our euglenas, these cute little guys, uh, came in the lab and when we were working with them, we found that under medium power in the microscope, most microscopes, um, these guys in the field of view were so small that all we really saw were tiny little flecks about this big. And you, you had to find them, uh, put some methyl cellulose on the slide, and look at these guys under high power, which is hard with some of the microscopes as, as the microscopes get older. But the euglenophyte, euglenophytes are a phylum of plant-like protists that can also eat. So they can photosynthesize and act as autotrophs, which is what we would expect. But these guys can also act as heterotrophs. So they can make their own food or they can go hunt it down and eat it. You see the little flagella coming out of the what's called the anterior end. We'll look at their structures a little bit more closely here in a second. But euglena are flagellated photosynthetic hunter cells. And they're so unique that we put them in their own phylum for a very good reason. Okay. So when it comes to studying euglena, first thing we should point out, and I'll let you fill in your diagrams, is we see what we would expect. Uh, in a eukaryotic organism, there is a nucleus, par for the course. Let's switch to slightly different color here. Uh, that'll do. So there's our nucleus, pointing to this structure here. And chloroplasts will look a little bit lopsided. Um, almost as if they're kind of a, a letter C, kind of a shrivelly C. And it's neat when you look at chloroplasts because inside you see these unique little... Let's zoom in so I can really show you. You can see these unique little stacks. And they, they have these little stacks of green material known as chlorophyll. So when you look at these guys from the side, they will look a little bit C-shaped, about like that. But they're also full of these little uh, bags of, mem well, specifically membranes. And those, those are technically known as grana, but in more advanced course, we get into what those are. Let's zoom out. Okay. So there's our chloroplasts. Um, as the plant makes car sugar, it, it puts it together in a larger molecule known as a carbohydrate. Now, I would just call it for what it really is. I would just say starch. And that's what you're looking at here. So starch storage bodies. And you'll see them throughout the cell. So contractile vacuole, we saw that before. That is where... Um, water vacuoles merge and eventually it's kind of like a bladder in a way I guess if I had to use it as a, uh, a more advanced example and this can go against right up against the edge of the cell and it can release its contents out of the cell and it helps it to essentially pee it, it you know even euglena have to go 
So, contract all vacuum. There you go. I skipped one intentionally here, one called the pellicle. And if you notice on our euglenoid here, you could see these, this is just outside the membrane. And it's sort of like these little thick folds. And it's on the exterior. And what it does is it, it's kind of like a tougher skin outside. And the pellicle acts like a, a tougher exterior skin so that the that euglena doesn't pop when it encounters something in this environment. Because the cell membrane is a pretty, it's kind of a flimsy thing. So the pellicle is just a little bit of tough material outside the cell membrane that gives it a little more protection. So now you know a pellicle. So I did say that our friend here is heterotrophic sometimes. In fact, if you turn off the light and it can't make its own food, it will go hunting. So it has a uh, simple structure here, which is just a light sensor. This light sensor right there, little eye spot, is quite close to the anterior end where the flagella come out. So if you had to call something on this, the head, you would look for the flagella and say that is the anterior end. The eye spot only senses light. It's it not like this thing actually sees the way humans or an insect would. It, the light is either on or off, so it can travel into the light, which is in its best interest to make food. Simple enough. The flagella are for motion, so we can tick that off pretty quickly. There's our flagella, as we would expect. However, looks like it's a little crowded in there because our gullet, zoom in a little bit more here, the gullet is this structure, as I'm highlighting now, this structure here. So they're indicating that the gullet is right there in which it would engulf. This little portion here, from there to there, is called the reservoir. And it wasn't indicated on your diagram. Let's see if I can move that over. There we go. That is the reservoir there. Simply enough, the reservoir is in the on the anterior end. It's just before the gullet and the flagella pass through it. There you go. Everything you wanted to know about euglena. The structure of the euglena will always be on every quiz and every test that I give on plant-like protus. So just to let you know, straight up, it's always going to be there. The chrysophytes are some of the most attractive um, protus. This is really, really neat. What I have to point out directly and right off the bat is that these guys, let's choose a nice yellow because it's very fitting. There we go, but like that. Have golden chloroplasts, golden colored. That makes it very, very interesting. The chrysophytes don't make sugar when they photosynthesize. These chrysophytes, when they photosynthesize, many of them will produce oil. And you might have seen a news story where they talk about uh, harvesting algae for biodiesel. Because these little critters will produce oil, if you give them enough nutrients, give them a place to live, shine sunlight on them, um, you can grow them in the desert if you want, as long as you have a, a special little installation. And you just just keep trickling these along. I'll show you this um, in a, a video in a minute. But you can set up installations where you let them photosynthesize. It could be out in the desert if you want. They'll produce oil. They produce an excessive amount, which can be pulled off. So it's an amazing little group. Let's pop out here for a second from the slideshow. Turn off reflection. There we go. And we can look at our examples, our diatoms and uh, cousins, the desmids. So let's go to a good resolution and take a look at this.
So there's a wonderful shot there. You can see the golden chloroplasts giving this uh, diatom relative here uh, a really nice appearance, and it puts it into the chrysophyte phylum. Now, if you look around the edge and you wonder, well, okay, why are you calling them chrysophytes? They're in, I, I've referred to them as the crystal phylum because they have these most beautiful shells. This shell around them is made up of silicon dioxide. You might know that as glass. It's a crystal container. We'll close that out. And we'll take a look at our desmids. There we go. And we'll watch one divide. Let's make let's get a nice resolution. There you go. So the diatoms typically look like a uh, like the top and bottom of a petri dish. But when you look at this one that's neat how this one is dividing um, it's forming a crystal shell to make up for its missing side so this thing has just gone through reproduction okay and it's a beautiful little silicon dioxide shell around the outside and there's uh, diatoms and desmids just think of them as members of uh, chrysophyta at this level that's pretty well what you'd need to know there we go so we'll pop back into the slideshow, tell you a little bit more about our friends here. There we go. And let's turn reflection back on. Nice. Okay. So these, it's, it's interesting how Mother Nature, you're, uh, when she's doing photosynthesis, I always would like to refer to Mother Nature in some sort of disembodied way, doesn't just have to make sugar and form carbohydrates like plants do. In fact, one of the oldest tricks and one of the most nutrient-rich materials is oil to be a photosynthetic product. So our diatoms can be extremely attractive because they're made, their shells are often composed of silicon dioxide. Um, that's a crystal and it can take on all these sort of wondrous shapes that you're seeing here. This has a lot to do with makeup, by the way. When you look at the glittery components of base makeup, um, set, sediment can be farmed. Now I'm talking about sediment um, just off the ocean, uh, just near the shoreline. And you can pull up this wonderful glittery material and purify it. And you can add it to base makeup and get all that wonderful glittery material um, on your face when you apply it. Because it is essentially silicon dioxide it gives that nice reflection and refraction so there's a little bit of dead diatom probably on your face right now if you're wearing base makeup there we go so let's call it for what it is SiO2 is essentially glass now when you look at diatoms they look, since they've kind of got a top and a bottom side, typical diatom, when you look at those petri plates, like the ones we used in the bacterial hunt, that look like this, and they kind of have a, a top and a bottom, right? This is kind of what we were using in the lab. When you look from the side, there's the, the lid, and then the smaller container goes underneath. So when these divide, it's kind of interesting because one side will get the top lid and the other side will get the small lid and they have to grow in the, um, the opposing side. They've got a, quite a challenge when they go to divide, but as we saw with the desmid a minute ago, they're certainly up to the challenge for that. Now let's look at our dinoflagellates. So this is another phylum. These guys aren't the chrysophytes. These are phylum pyrophyta. So let's scribble that in. Phylum pyrophyta. So pyro is in red, fire-like. And what's hard to see is that they have little flagella. They are motile. And they have these little flagella sticking out of their shells. So they do have a shell, a top and a bottom. And they're photosynthetic and they're also heterotrophic. So when you look at the protocin, you wonder, 
you know, why can't they be plants and why can't they be animals? You're looking at something that's plant-like, but it's not even multicellular. So it doesn't fit into the animal or plant kingdom. In fact, you have to get comfortable with that. Maybe it's a bit of both. That's why we're looking at the plant-like, in this case, unicellular algae, because this guy is alone uni. And when you look at what their bodies are composed of, with the chrysophytes, we saw that they had silicon dioxide shells. Well, if you come down and check out our friend down here, they've got thick plates of cellulose around the outside. That's pretty interesting. You could see that the protists were thinking about having a protective armor, if you will, of cellulose really before plants ever did. So it was kind of in the mix, is what I like to tell my students. This picture up here is very important. Just let it come into focus there, because that's what they would look like sort of from the side, sort of almost like these, oh, I always refer to it, they look like Klingon birds of prey to me from the, from the uh, Star Trek series, the, the Klingon sort of spaceships. Very neat little shape there. So we should define what phytoplankton is. Phytoplankton, algae, stuff floating on the surface or in the water column. It's They have to more or less be floating near the sunlight. These guys can't go down as deep as, as for example, as we saw with the, with the multicellular algae, like the reds. They're found near the surface of the ocean. What you have to remember about the ocean is that they are the lungs of the planet. Very important to know that. And I'll tell you why. Because the oceans are taking in phenomenal amounts of carbon dioxide. And as photosynthesis occurs, they're producing tremendous amounts of oxygen. Each one of these little critters may not look like much. However, they're doing... Oops, let's grab a nice red... Each one of these little critters is eking out a tremendous amount of oxygen, which is why we have to keep the oceans healthy because must, must, blah, huh, much of the air that we breathe, the O2 content is coming from them. Further, the O2 content that they're producing drifts up very high to the stratosphere and very important because there's this thing called O3, which is ozone, which helps to block UV radiation reaching the surface of the planet. So our phytoplankton, which are big gobs of this unicellular algae, this phytoplankton is doing an amazing job of maintaining our atmosphere. Half, let's emphasize that, half of Earth's photosynth photosynthesis is happening by the phytoplankton. Remember, it's not just the chrysophytes, and it's not just the pyrophytes, and it's not just it's not just the seaweeds it you have to think of it all as a, a macro eco ecosystem of plants that are helping to do the photosynthesis and draw the carbon dioxide which is being produced in very high quantities especially with us burning fossil fuels the way we do their job becomes even more important so we're certainly giving them enough co2 aren't we you look off the coastline and you say, well, okay, so what do you mean by phytoplankton? What, what is this? What is all this stuff right here? Now, this is a view, a very high altitude aerial view, and you could see these wispy sort of green colors, and you can even see it extending out to sea because they're floating on the surface. And that plankton, that unicellular algae, is not only extremely important to our planet, but it's drifting just offshore and it's producing an amazing amount of oxygen to help keep us. Oh, I like to think of it, they're not just doing it for us. For them, it's a waste product, but they're keeping our planet healthy, alive, and very much in tune. So this is 20.3, um, sort of the end of the unicellular algae. little quizzy poo here, but let's go back to the groups that we studied. All the way back to the beginning, ha ha, there they are. So we looked at Euglena, and there's some neat videos online, ones that I didn't show. Euglenophyta, Chrysophyta, 
and our dinoflagellates. Now, before I leave, I want to show you something about the dinoflagellates. This is very cool. They're called the terrible flagellates. So this normally doesn't come up in the course, but I have to show you anyways. When you look at something called red tide, actually, I think a better place to do this, I've already got this lined up on line, but I'll show you. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. Myself and Mr. Carr show this all the time. If there's an algal bloom of dinoflagellates, this is why they call it red tide. You see that poor little person in the boat there. He looks, run, get away. These dinoflagellates will suck up all the oxygen in the water column, and it will cause massive uh, fish death as they're their metabolisms are, are on overload and they're taking up all the oxygen. Um, when you look at the consequences of red tide, you see it's pretty nasty, but red tide can also be quite attractive. Here's our, here's our dead fish. You can see them dying in droves because the dissolved oxygen content of the water has, has been uh, highly reduced to the point where they can't survive. And adding fertilizers and things like that to the water uh, will only increase the bloom of these critters. It looks like rust in the water. Now I'll just pop out for a second. I've got a nice nifty little YouTube moment for you here. Red tide um, at night, uh, let's see here, plant like protus, can be uh, quite amazing. So let's go to Red Tide Makes the News. So the glowing water is off Tampa Bay, Florida. Let's make sure we've got a nice... Yeah, that's perfect. Tampa Bay is known for its beauty even after dark. That's because Mother Nature loves lights both in the sky and for the past several weeks underwater as well. We get reports of it quite frequently, especially this time of year. Biologists at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Marine Institute in downtown St. Petersburg focus their research on red tide, but are also experts on the tiny cells responsible for this unusual glow seen behind boats in Tampa Bay. When the organism is disturbed, it emits a little flash. An up-close look under the microscope shows this tiny dinoflagellate, more specifically Pyrodinium Baja mints, magnified here 400 times. And this little area right here is what lets me identify it. Any disturbance will do. Stirring, pouring, even throwing a net into the water will cause the glow. As a defense mechanism, the organisms are producing luciferin, the same chemical that makes a lightning bug glow. And the more dinoflagellates disturbed, the brighter the blue-green glow. Experts aren't sure how long this latest bloom will last, but say if you want to see a little of Mother Nature's magic, you'd better hurry. Now, it gets more interesting if you snoop around on YouTube a little bit. Um, you could see Red Tide with the bioluminescence. Um, here it is in San Diego in 2011. So I think I'll just mute that. There you go. Let's put that on full screen just to get the idea of it. Um, oh, that was too fast. There we go. And it's, it's not a good idea. You never go out into red tide. They're producing toxins. And it's not only are they gobbling up the dissolved oxygen, they're producing toxins. It's killing fish en masse. And some surfers have gone out and decided they wanted to surf at night in this. It's not a good idea because you can come into contact with those toxins as well. So quite attractive. Very nice. There's something else that they do. It's called paralytic shellfish poisoning. Um, when it comes to red tide... You have to watch out... Uh, for what they produce because when they release the toxins into the water paralytic shellfish poisoning and I should be able to show this will close a beach and there it is what happens is they release their toxins into 
the sediments and that affects things like clams and oysters etc and they become inedible inedible and they're poisoned essentially you can't consume them so um, fish and wildlife or the department of fisheries and oceans will issue a sign like this there we go that's what i wanted to show you that the area has been closed because of a um, contamination by these protists these dinoflagellates if you consume the flesh of contaminated shellfish um, they call it paralytic for a reason uh, you will it can induce paralysis it can stop your breathing and you can die as a result so this is this is a sign they've had to trot out from uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans in the past when red tide has been an issue okay folks so that was quite a bit to nibble on there what we'll come back to a little bit later um, when we look at some more of these cells is we'll be looking at a few of these here we have to still have to look at clammy demonis and a few more of our friends but that's for another lecture and another time so in the meantime and in between time folks have a good one study up we'll see you later